Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by our audiobook slash paperback slash ebook. And you can pick it up at bit.ly slash 50 dinosaur tales. It's the number five zero. And that's because that's the name of the book. This week in our 278th episode, we have a bunch of dinosaur news and we have dinosaur of the day, Kakuru. We're also brainstorming some other things we can do while many of us are stuck at home waiting for the coronavirus to peter out. And just a quick update on us. If you listened to our episode from last week, we're doing much better. Sabrina's still coughing a lot, unfortunately. Trying not to cough throughout this episode. But there are very few tests and we're not in a serious risk group. So we're not getting tested. We're just staying isolated just in case. Yes. So for everybody out there, keep practicing your social distancing and wash your hands 20 seconds. Yeah, and and just take care. We wish you all well and to be safe. Definitely. And it's not just affecting us either. We heard that Jurassic World Dominion, the Jurassic World 3, is on hold. Along with many other movies. Yeah, so it's starting to affect the world of dinosaurs. (laughs) They're they're long extinct. (laughs) Not the birds. That's true. (laughs) And before we get into our regularly scheduled programming, we want to thank some of our patrons who are the driving force behind this podcast. And this week, we'd like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pascoe, Gabe, TRX Dinosaurs, and Michael. Yeah, thank you so much to everybody. And it's really great to have this community always, but especially now, it's always nice to talk about dinosaurs in whatever capacity, which we do on our Discord. Yeah, I'm really loving the Discord right now because when I'm feeling overwhelmed by coronavirus stuff, I can go on there and just talk about news (laughs) and, and, you know, people share pictures from around them and different dinosaur stuff that's going on. So it's a nice little escape. And you can also talk about whatever you want in the off topic section. It doesn't have to be only dinosaurs. There are other hobbies that get discussed as well. And I think I'll be adding another channel soon with maybe if we do like a group watch of a Jurassic Park movie or something like that. That way we can all like chat about it while we're watching it together. I think that could be fun. We're looking for other stuff to do as well. And if you're a patron and you haven't downloaded Discord yet, I highly recommend it. It's an app available on everything, but you can also just use it as a website, sort of like Slack, I guess, if you're familiar with that, where you can post either links or videos or pictures or whatever you want. Lots of emojis and reactions happening too. And jumping into the news, we have a new sauropod. Nice. I'll cheer you up, Sabrina. (laughs) This one's from Southern Mongolia. And it was published in Systematic Paleontology and written by Alexander Averyanov and Alexei Lopatin. And if you're wondering why these obviously Russian names are publishing on a Mongolian find, it's because (laughs) the dinosaur was excavated in 1970 by a Russian paleontologist. And obviously, those fossils are still housed in Russia, which is kind of interesting because there's been pretty big repatriation efforts happening to Mongolia lately. So I wonder if these are going to end up making their way back to Mongolia at some point. But for now, they're at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, Russia. And the dinosaur is named Abdareinurus barsboldi, and it's called (laughs) Abdareinurus. It's so hard to say because the area is called Abdrantnuru, and then the Russian version of it sounds more like Abdarein, I guess. And That formation is from the late Cretaceous, I should say. I think there's not a lot of Jurassic rock around there. And the end of the dinosaur name after the Abdrantnuru, the us part, is because urus is Greek for tail. So it basically means a tail from Abdrantnuru, if you put it together. Then Barsboldi is after the Mongolian paleontologist Rinchen Barsbold, who is frequently named. (laughs) In species? Yes, I'd say he's probably the most famous Mongolian paleontologist, and when in doubt, people just put bars bold eye at the end, it seems like. In this find, unfortunately, they only found nine tail vertebrae. Oh, that explains the name. Yeah, so basically, it's a tail. (laughs) They make some specific details about they have, you know, vertebrae from this part of the tail, and then there's like one vertebrae that's from closer to the middle of the tail versus the end of the tail, but really, it's all just tail vertebrae. 
and they're in pretty good shape. Many of the details of the vertebrae are preserved, and it was in good enough shape that they said they found, quote, 16 unique or rare characters, end quote, in the tail, which is a lot. For just the tail, yeah. Yeah, and vertebrae sometimes don't have a lot of diagnostic criteria in them, especially if they're not well preserved. They can just look like, oh yeah, it's from a sauropod, and that's about all we know. But these have quite a bit of unique characters, so they named a new genus for it, obviously. Did they say what the unique characters were? They did, but they're like, oh man. It's, you it's know, pretty like, technical. Yeah, the post-zygopophyses extends laterally, blah, 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 mm-hmm. where it, it doesn't really mean a lot to anyone who doesn't study even specifically this group of sauropods. But what it boils down to is basically they say it's highly specialized. They didn't say what it was specialized for, <laughs> but I think the reason they said that is it had characteristics of early titanosaurs and some characteristics of non-titanosaur sauropodomorphs. So it kind of has this mix of features that's unusual. And because of that, they think maybe it's in its own group, sort of at the base of titanosaurs or maybe just outside of it. And it's a group that we hadn't seen before, or otherwise it's just a weird hybrid with convergent evolution. It's really hard to tell from just the tail. But they did include some nice paleo art in the paper itself, and it shows it having a really flexible tail. Is that the specialization, maybe? I don't know. They One of the features of the tail is that it has kind of stronger links in between the vertebrae, which made me think it might be less flexible. Hmm. But I don't know. I mean... That was only one element of the vertebrae, so maybe it just meant it had a stronger tail or something. They also depict it as having osteoderms, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Probably because it's in Titanosauria, likely, and it's late Cretaceous. The paleoart also includes a couple of its contemporaries, the Ankylosaur, Pinacosaurus, and a soft-shelled turtle, which is basically like a leatherback turtle sort of thing on the beach. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting. We don't get too many sauropods from Mongolia. A lot of times it's theropods and things. So it's nice to get a little more detail on the big guys. (laughs) Yep, always. And up next, we've got another paper on a paleothermometer technique. We've talked a little bit about in the past. This one was published in Science Advances by Robin Dawson and others. And the paleothermometer thing is a really cool technique that you can use. Well, that paleontologists use. I don't know if we have the (laughs) equipment required because you have to look at isotopes of chemicals. But what they look at is they look at the ratio of carbon-13, oxygen-18, and oxygen-16. And for short, they call it the delta-47 value. And that's because if you add up 13, 18, and 16 in those isotopes, you get 47. So this delta-47 value changes depending on the temperature that the animal was when it grew which is really similar to oxygen isotopes that are used in ice core samples when we're looking into the past, trying to figure out what temperature Earth was over time and looking at sort of how carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases might have affected it. It's the same sort of thing, but instead of looking at ice core samples, we're looking at eggshell enamel or teeth (laughs) enamel. And they use enamel most of the time because it's a little bit more resilient and it's less likely to chemically change over time when it fossilizes, whereas bone is more porous and can be affected a little bit more. But theoretically, you could do this with some really well-preserved bone as well. So previously, when we've talked about paleothermometers in dinosaurs, we've basically talked about papers that got to the result of dinosaurs living with a body temperature somewhere in the mid-30s degrees Celsius, which is roughly in the 90s Fahrenheit. And that makes it much warmer than a typical modern reptile, but maybe on the cooler side for a mammal or maybe about average for a mammal, but definitely at a temperature where we were thinking it's more active. It's at least a mesotherm, if not an endotherm, meaning warm-blooded or, you know, in between cold-blooded and warm-blooded. But in this paper, they looked at two different areas. The first set came from Alberta, and the fossils were all about 75 million years old. In Alberta at the time, in this formation in southern Alberta, the baseline mean annual temperature was about 13 degrees Celsius or 55 degrees Fahrenheit, obviously much warmer than the average temperature across the year in Alberta is now. (laughs) But that's also a lot cooler than 30 degrees Celsius. So what they wanted to do was to compare the paleothermometer results of the fossils there and see 
well, is it warmer than 13 degrees Celsius and 55 degrees Fahrenheit? Because that would indicate that the animals had a metabolism that was keeping their temperature up and above the average temperature in the area. And I should say the way they came up with that 13 degrees Celsius number is they found some turtle shells and fish scales, as well as some vertebrate teeth that they think were from cold-blooded things. And they gave that 13 degrees Celsius number. Fish scales must be so hard to find. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they found like a fossilized fish and just took some scales off of it yeah. to test. Or maybe, yeah, you could find loose ones. Sometimes they find those little tiny micro fossils that can be things like tiny mammal teeth and stuff. Right. So it's possible some fish scales were in there too. But yeah, finding a, an isolated fish scale would be quite crazy. But in terms of the dinosaur fossils that they're using for comparison, they were using exclusively eggshell fragments. And these included Troodon, Myasaura, Hippacrosaurus, and what they called an indeterminate Lambiosaurine hadrosaur. So you could think of something like maybe a Parasaurolophus. They went through all of the fossils and carefully looked at them to make sure they were in good enough shape to give reliable results. And unfortunately, their indeterminate Lambiosaurine hadrosaur had a microstructure that wasn't preserved very well, which means the chemistry could have been significantly tainted, and that meant that they didn't even bother doing an analysis because whatever results they got could have just been from the rock around it and just totally screwed up their analysis. But the other three were in good shape. That's good. At least it was the three that we knew for sure what dinosaurs they were. Yeah, I like that too. Although in some parts they call it a troodon, and in other parts they just say a theropod. So it's a little bit... I wonder, and I, I also kind of wonder because a lot of people question whether a troodon should be an actual genus. Mm -hmm. And maybe because of that, the troodon has by far the widest range. So one of the samples and one of the individuals, for that matter, was 38 degrees plus or minus 4 degrees Celsius. Another was only 27 degrees plus or minus 4 degrees Celsius. And the last was 28 plus or minus 3 degrees Celsius. And in Fahrenheit, that gives you the enormous range of between 73 and 108 degrees. That's a lot. Yeah. If you were a human, on the low end of that, you'd be dead from being too cold. And on the high end, you'd be dead from being too hot. So <laughs> it ranges from way hotter than us to way colder than us. And given the ranges on these, they do think that some of these individuals actually were closer to that 73 degree temperature. And some of them were in the hundreds. Wow. So... Yeah, there's some very crazy variability happening with these theropods. Yeah, that's so weird to think about because humans were all pretty much the same. Yeah, and it, it also makes me wonder, they didn't mention this, but I wonder if it could be that they were more of a mesotherm, you know, like it was keeping their, their metabolism was keeping their body temperature above that 55 degrees Fahrenheit mean annual temperature, but maybe it wasn't as stable as our temperature, you know, like it had some variability to it. But the other two fossils were much more stable. The Myasaura was 44 degrees plus or minus 2 degrees Celsius or 108 to 115 Fahrenheit. That's very hot. <laughs> yes. And the Hippacrosaurus was only 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit. And that one's a, approximate. But I do wonder, because there was only one specimen of each of these, if they had tested like four Myasaurus. <laughs> Maybe they'd have four. a crazy range too. Yeah, exactly. But they kind of talk about it as if Troodon has this crazy range and the other two don't. I don't know, though. I think we need more sampling to really confirm that. For comparison, they also looked at a 69 million year old eggshell from Romania. And at the time, we were talking about this in the last episode, Romania was on Hetega Island, which was subtropical. And the temperature varied a little bit more than we think it did in Alberta. But we think it was probably around 25 degrees Celsius or 77 Fahrenheit. So it would have been warmer, basically, than Alberta. We're not sure exactly how much warmer, but it would have been warmer. So the big question there is, if it's warmer, were the dinosaurs there maybe just taking advantage of the warm environment and just using the ambient temperature and using that instead of having their own internal temperature control? And they used a eggshell, which was probably either from a titanosaur or the hadrosauroid Talmatosaurus, which was our dinosaur of the day last week, <laughs> oddly enough. They found that its body temperature was 36 degrees plus or minus 1 Celsius, or between 95 and 99 Fahrenheit. So very close to us. And I should say, technically, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is 37 degrees 
but I used the number of significant digits they did. That's why I said 99 Fahrenheit. And if you're in the US and you think that 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is the average and typical body temperature of a human, there's no precision like that in the human body. It varies a couple degrees north and south all the time. Which is why you don't need to worry too much if you're at like 98.8 or... Yeah, or even if you're 98 or 99. Yeah. And some people just consistently are like 97.8 degrees and are totally fine. So in the end, the researchers found that even in Romania, where the temperature was about 77 degrees, this hadrosauroid slash titanosaur was about 20 degrees warmer. And therefore, all of the dinosaurs that they tested were warmer than the environment, including even the coldest sample of the troodon at 73 Fahrenheit. That's still about 20 degrees warmer than the baseline mean annual temperature in Alberta. So we're getting more and more evidence that dinosaurs were, in fact, warm blooded or I should say endothermic. Not that most people are looking for more evidence at this point, but it is really interesting to see what specifically their body temperature might have been, especially in the ones that were warmer than us. Yeah. That, that kind of blows my mind that we've gone from them being these like cold, swampy, right, marsh slow animals. moving. And now we know they were quick. Yeah. And they might even have run hotter than us. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting. Well, knowing their temperature might help us figure out more about their behaviors like yeah. down the road too. Yeah, it could. And possibly how they might have had to incubate their eggs, you know, if they had uh really make sure they were warm because maybe the embryos needed to be really warm as well. There's lots of exciting things you could look into. The more you know. <laughs> in other news, in Craig, Colorado, there's a 74 million year old hadrosaur known as Walter who lives in the basement of Colorado Northwestern Community College. And that's one of the few community colleges that's named as a legal fossil repository. Why do you say lives? Oh, okay. I guess is stored at. <laughs> okay. You're right. You're right. It's <laughs> so this college has a program where students are working towards their associate's degrees and they can work on real fossils. And both the city and county are now interested in having a small museum connected to the college and bringing in tourists who are driving between Dinosaur National Monument and Rocky Mountain National Park. We did that. Yeah. There wasn't a lot in between there. No, but there might be soon. Yeah. I was expecting you to say that it was a costume or something or some sort of living style hadrosaurid, but it's just a fossil, regular fossil? Yes. Okay. I do have a costume story next, though. So, I mean, there's a lot of great costume stories out there. We're not going to share all of them on the podcast, but if you want updates, we're sharing them on Twitter and Facebook. But this one was too good to not share on the show, too. So in Chicago, the Field Museum let out sue the t-rex and maybe you already saw this video and by that i mean it's a person in an inflatable t-rex costume walk around the museum because the museum's closed and there's a video and a tweet where they wrote quote once sue heard about the at shed aquarium penguins and that one there was a video that went around of penguins walking around there's one really fascinated by a fish in an aquarium yeah it's they just released cute. them in in the zoo to like wander around as if they were people yeah <laughs> it's really fun to watch anyway and then they said, we really didn't have a choice, end quote. So in Sue's video, Sue's looking at the taxidermy penguins. <laughs> it all comes full circle with the penguins. <laughs> and Sue also tweeted, because Sue has a Twitter account, that the visit to the penguins was to check on, quote, my docile army. <laughs> yeah, dinosaurs are going to re-inherit the earth. I'm convinced of it. Yep. Sue knows. And there's another video of Sue, the inflatable T-Rex, hanging out at the information desk. And that accompanying tweet is, quote, we were warned of the theropod uprising, and now they have access to information. <laughs> <laughs> so while at the desk, uh, Sue, I guess, learned that birds are dinosaurs. And then the museum tweeted, quote, Sue learns birds are avian dinosaurs, demands we update the museum map to Hall of Tiny Theropods instead of Hall of Birds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's been more videos of sue around the museum too yeah if you're a museum worker at a time when a museum is closed it's the perfect time to do goofy stuff like this oh yeah <laughs> yeah there's actually a lot of cool things museums are doing to keep people involved or entertained or learning and we're hoping to put together a resource page soon so stay tuned for that 
I got a couple of comic news updates. So DC Comics has shared preview pages from Dark Knight's Death Metal number one, and that includes a T-Rex Batman. What? Yeah. I don't know too much about it, but one of the images shows a white T-Rex with a black bat mask. <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. If anyone reads that, let us know the storyline. I'm really interested. <laughs> uh, it, I'm sure it must be some sort of like genetic testing or something that turns Batman into a T-Rex somehow. That's crazy. Or maybe yeah, an alternate universe. Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking alternate universe. I really don't know any of the backstory. <laughs> <laughs> Gotham full of just all sorts of different dinosaurs battling it out. Oh, that'd be cool. What does that bat signal look like? <laughs> <laughs> like our logo. <laughs> <laughs> the other comic news, Marvel's Fantastic Four has Sky, which is an alien superhero with the ability to talk to dinosaurs and birds of course so in fantastic four number 20 sky hangs out with a group of pigeons on earth and then later in the issue talks to a group of t-rex about colonial oppression and indigenous rights there's a whole storyline there uh i read the summary but i don't know how to summarize it well so if you're into comics you should read it also got a news story about a mom in the UK who had a really great idea of creating a dinosaur themed board game at home to keep her kids entertained because everybody's staying at home and she used props and toys they already had to create dino land so in the game they have uh cut out leaves or something leaves that are numbered and you use those to get around the board game which is the entire house and you roll dice to make your way through the house which is known as the infested forest so what are the leaves for if the dice tell you how far to go? The leaves are what you step on. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then you roll three and you get to go step on three leaves. Gotcha. Yeah. And you want to avoid getting eaten by dinosaurs and watch out for the bubbling volcano. Those are good things to avoid generally. Good mm -hmm. life lessons. Yeah. <laughs> and the goal of the game is you make it to camp. And in the picture, it looks like it's a fort next to a, a pretty fun dinosaur mural in their living room. And if you land on a carnivorous dinosaur, because there's different things on the leaves, some of them are safe, but some of them have things, then you take three steps back. If you land on an herbivorous dinosaur, you jump until your next turn. And then if you land on a volcano, you miss a turn. And then in their house, they even have a mini ball pit. They were like really That's set That's very up. fancy. So I'm thinking we, I mean, we have dinosaur toys and stuff. We could probably set something similar up. <laughs> no, no kids to play with, but that's okay. We could just play together instead. Yeah. Or maybe if you've got kids at home, maybe this inspires you. So last, this has been making its rounds on Twitter and online and everything too. Food Network has a show, I think it's called Buddy vs. Duff. Yeah, it's basically one of those baking, like a bake-off type show, but they're all making cakes. Yeah. And so it's Duff and then Buddy from Cake Boss. And I think they've been doing this a few seasons now. And so this challenge was a prehistoric challenge, which was great. Yeah, they went to the American Museum of Natural History and they went through the hall and one of the teams immediately went to the ankylosaurus and was like, we got to make this thing. <laughs> yeah, life size. Which to me was also obvious that that would be by far the best cake wow, to make. Of course, to you. <laughs> so they made a life size Zool cake. Yeah, it was really cool. So Ralph, who is the head sculptor, is also a huge dinosaur enthusiast. And he was saying, well, there's this American ankylosaur named Zool, which is just described, and it has this amazing head preservation. So we can make a really realistic version of it because we know what it looked like so well. And then the other team, it was fun too, because they picked the other Thyreophoran in the hall. They went to the Stegosaurus. Oh, yeah. And created one of those, which was also really cool. Well, they did more of a diorama where the poor Stegosaurus is drowning in pudding, which is a tar pit. Mm -hmm. But there's also the asteroid is about to hit and there's a volcano erupting. And there's a Quetzalcoatlus on the Stegosaurus back that is like biting off its tail. Yeah. It's a oh, whole thing. Their effects were really good, though. Like it, They got the Quetzalcoatlus to bite the tail and then raspberry um i don't know what i guess sauce yeah. came out of the tail like blood <laughs> yeah and the quetzalcoatlus was like flapping its wings slowly but theirs had a lot more technical inaccuracies in it like the pterosaur had teeth and it shouldn't have it also kind of had a weird body because the tail started falling off at one point so they sort of changed it up and then obviously 
maybe most glaringly, the Quetzalcoatlus and Stegosaurus did not live at even remotely the same time, right. which several people pointed out to them. So I think since they were being reviewed in a museum, yeah, they were taking a lot of attention to this detail. But I thought they did a really good job at the sculpts of it. I thought the Stegosaurus looked really oh, cool yeah. and uh, the plates, quite realistic too. They did a they had a baby Stegosaurus head popping up from the tar pit slash pudding. I think it was a baby Zool. It oh, was it was Baby Zool? Okay, yeah, yeah, they were throwing shade at the other team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they did little proto feathers on the Quetzalcoatlus too. Mm -hmm. they were, and I, I thought the texture looked pretty cool. I, I liked it. But the Zool was just so much more impressive. Well, it was amazing. Spoiler alert, the team that made Zool won. Oh, yeah, in a landslide. Oh, yeah. And it's so scientifically accurate. Even Victoria Arbor tweeted that it was scientifically accurate. Yes, so they, they started by doing the underside of Zool, and they had a little tool they were using to put texture on it, like it had little osteoderms, that sort of pebbly, rough texture like you see on an alligator. And they did the entire bottom of a, what was it, like 16 foot long? 17 foot long. <laughs> yeah, so they started with just the bottom of that in modeling chocolate, right? which is basically like, you know, clay sort of and doing it a couple square inches at a time yeah. for hours. Well, they only had 24 hours to do the whole thing. Yeah. And then when they flipped it over, the chocolate fell off. So they had to do it all over again, upside down now, while yeah. other people were working on the top. And the whole thing is basically made out of a whole bunch of layers of cake stacked up and then sculpted together, mm -hmm. which I thought made it look kind of like the layers of stratigraphy of rock. <laughs> I was kind of hoping one of them might kind of... If you cut it open? Yeah, like include a little bit of the actual cake into it to show the stratigraphy. They could have really done it on the crazy diorama because they had so much they could have just had some stratigraphy off to the side. <laughs> but... With the Zool, obviously, you couldn't do that because they don't have stratigraphy inside their body. No. <laughs> they said the final Zool, when they were all done with it, was about 3,000 pounds. It was crazy. It, they put a whole bunch of wheels on the bottom of this platform they were rolling around, and the wheels kept breaking off. So they ended up having to rig up a, a custom setup to slide it into the museum. Watching them do that reminded me of how we'd heard it described getting Zool in to be yeah. repaired. And it actually, Barely fits through the doors, super heavy. Yeah. <laughs> And when they added the the modeling chocolate over it and stuff, and they were like flipping it over, it was just like at a dig where you put the plaster over it and then you have to like <laughs> carefully flip it over and hope it doesn't fall apart. Yep. It was pretty fun to see. They had some amazing details too. So like the eyes were made of sugar and they made a whole bunch of different eyes and then they made some, like they picked the most realistic looking ones. They had the textured skin, like what Garrett was saying. I saw a lot of rice crispy stuff being put on for the spikes on the side of the body. Oh, yeah. The eyelid was also modeling chocolate, and that was really realistic looking. But the coolest thing, I think, was the scutes. They used gumballs of all different sizes. And, yeah. Yeah, and then covered it with a thin layer of modeling chocolate. So I think they put a bunch of frosting down first. I, I couldn't tell. They kind of skipped over that part a little bit. And then they just stuck gumballs ranging inside from kind of those huge jawbreaker ones that are three or four inches in diameter. And then they had normal gumball size ones that are like an inch in diameter. And they stuck them in the entire back of it. So they must have had thousands of them in there. And then the modeling chocolate over that gave it that perfect look like it had that bumpy, mm -hmm. hard skin to go with it. And then, of course, on top of that, they did more detail and they had the spikes sticking through the modeling chocolate as well. And I think the only complaints they had was like the angle of a couple of the shoulder spikes mm -hmm. and the fact that a couple of the spikes didn't seem sharp enough. But other than that, it was just spot on. It sounded like they really had to dig to come up with criticisms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was really great. They also made the tail move. Yeah, they tried to mechanize it, but I think it just weighed too much for the sort of equipment that they had handy. So they had to make it so that it was manual. You had to reach in and you could wiggle it back and forth. <laughs> but yeah, what what is that tail? It's like seven feet long or something. And so heavy. They joked about using the Zool cake sculpture to smash the other cake, yeah. which I really wish they would have done because it would have just been so fun. <laughs> yeah. But if you're looking for an hour to while away while you're social distancing, it's a good episode to watch for sure. Mm -hmm. If only we could taste it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did it at one of those sleepover events at AM&H. And I, I don't think the kids actually got to eat any of it, though. 
Hey, you never know. Maybe they got to taste a little of the raspberry or the pudding or something. That could be, yeah. Yeah, I do wonder how long they kept the cakes there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Probably just for the night. Probably. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, another thing you can do if you're looking for a way to fill your time while social distancing is cuddle up with a book like 50 Dinosaur Tales, our book. Yeah, we have it in audio paperback ebook. We recommend audio or ebook for easiest delivery. Yeah, meaning no real delivery, Mm -hmm. (laughs) electronic delivery. I think the audiobook is the best version personally because you get to hear our lovely voices. <laughs> Garrett's not biased at all. <laughs> yeah. I also read very slow, so I love audiobooks. And it's partly why we make audiobooks because I'm really into them. <laughs> they all have the exact same content in them, which is the 50 short stories about dinosaurs and then over 100 lists of facts about the dinosaurs. So, You get all of the dinosaurs that we've covered in the previous top 10 dinosaur books, and then also 10 new ones that we released with this book. So if you want to purchase your copy, then go to bit.ly slash 50 dinosaur tales, and that's five zero and then dinosaur and tales, T-A-L-E-S. That link's in our show notes too. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Kukuru, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Discord and Patreon. So thanks. Kakuru was a theropod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Australia. It was probably carnivorous and bipedal, and probably six and a half to ten feet or two to three meters long. It probably had long, slender legs, so that would have made it a fast runner. But it's really hard to know for sure because the holotype is the complete right tibia, the shin bone, and the referred material is a pedal phalanx, which is a toe bone. So there's not much to go off of. Researchers think there's similarities to Avamimus in the tail. Microvenator, Ornitholestes in the tibia proportions, Calamospondylus, and Silurus in form. The tibia is broken into about 10 large pieces and is about 13 inches or 33 centimeters long. And the tibia is slender. It seems to be getting long and narrow up to the astragalus, which is the ankle bone, though no ankle bone was found. Kukuru may be related to Silurids, or it could be uh, Belisoroidea. That's based on the way that the tibia near the ankle bone looks. The type and only species is Kukuru kuyani, and the fossils that were found were opalized. They were discovered in opal fields in Andamook, South Australia. What a South Australian dinosaur. Yeah. We're always talking about Victorian and Queensland. Yes, and actually it might be Andamook, South Australia. Not totally sure on the pronunciation. So Anthony Fleming acquired the fossils in 1973 for his opal shop, and paleontologist and then curator of South Australian Museum Neville Pledge heard about it from a Mr. Santini, who was an opal miner. Fleming allowed photos to be taken and two casts, the tibia, lower leg bone, and the toe bone, to be made. And soon after the casts were made, the fossils were auctioned off to an anonymous buyer, and nobody heard about it again until 2004 when the South Australian Museum bought the tibia for $22,000. In December 2018, the South Australian Museum got the toe bone after Joy Cloister, who won an auction bid online, it was a liquidation sale in Sydney that was all fossils, asked opal buyers for advice, and they connected her with the South Australian Museum, so now that museum has the toe bone on display. I think we heard about that at the time. It was a pretty fun story. <laughs> they ended up on eBay and the museum got involved pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool when these things work out. So Neville Pledge and Ralph Muller described and named Kukuru in 1980 based on the cast. The genus name means rainbow serpent in Australian Aboriginal mythology. It comes from a dreaming story about a rainbow serpent. That's a cool origin for the name. Yeah. And the species name refers to the local Aboriginal tribe, the Kuyani. And that's spelled a couple different ways. You've got K-U-J-A-N-I, also G-U-Y-A-N-I. Yeah, I would have thought at first that Kakuru would have been a Japanese name because it sort of sounds like Japanese. Mm. I really like the sound of it. Me too. And the meaning. So the casts are at the South Australian Museum and also the Peabody Museum, Yale University, Australian Museum, and Queensland Museum. So there's a lot of places you can go and see this. But once the museums are all open again, I should say. That's true. Because, well, some of them were closed even before, (laughs) let alone with coronavirus. 
And our fun fact of the day is about dinosaurs in Australia. Hmm. It's continuing our series of which state slash territory has the most dinosaurs in the country. (laughs) So in our Australian installment, the winners are Victoria and Queensland with the most non-avian dinosaur fossils in Australia. That's according to the Paleobio database. And I suspect that Queensland is soon to pull far ahead because we found out about a lot of unpublished finds while we were on our road trip, especially from Queensland, less so in Victoria. Almost all of the finds in Victoria are from that dinosaur cove area, whereas in Queensland they're spread all over the place, and there's lots of museums popping up and expanding all over Queensland. So I think they're really about to dig up a lot of stuff, and a lot of them are starting to get their paleontologists involved so that things are getting published. But as it stands now, Victoria is technically winning with 66 published finds, whereas Queensland has 64. (laughs) That's very close. Yeah, they're essentially tied. That's why I just said there's both of them. Western Australia is in third with 53 finds. A lot of those are footprints because, you know, they have that amazing trackway in Western Australia and Broome, which just looks so cool. And New South Wales is in fourth with 26. South Australia only has three, including Kakuru. And then the other areas of Australia have zero. For now. True. You never know. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks again for listening and being a part of our community. We really appreciate it. Please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And we have a new way of listening to our Dinosaur of the Day segment on Amazon on the voice thing, which I won't say the name so I don't trigger it accidentally, (laughs) but the skill is called Dinosaur of the Day. And just real quick on Amazon, we had to limit everything to three minutes, so you won't always get the full segment. But you'll get, in many cases, most of it. Thanks again, and until next time.